not a new show. Right? <laughs> hey, date yourself, brother. <laughs> All right, am I good? Or do I have to eat this mic? Yeah. All right. Wait, all right. Standing with the five mic? <laughs> yeah. All right, all right. So, where are you from? <laughs> Got him. Test. Yes. Okay. Oh, I got him. Oh, 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 you just won. Oh, but it's not. Take it out. All right. If you would like to ask a question, queue up in the middle, and we'll have you guys come up and ask your question. All right, cool. Okay. Uh, anyways, given that uh, metal is like this, big mythical, like mythological event that you guys did and are probably gonna play off of for like the next 30 years and stuff like that. And given that uh, now the connection of Bruce Wayne's suffering to the Book of Job is, is more clear than ever, it's been pronounced so uh, explicitly and wonderfully, I wanted to know if there were any myths, mythological stories, or anything that any of you still felt like you wanted to touch on and use in like the world of Batman that you feel like you haven't gotten a chance to yet. Also, thanks for making Mr. Miracle. That's like really cool for anyone who like takes a little pill every day just to live more easily. That was really awesome for you to do. So thanks. Welcome to the Mr. Miracle panel. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, like, in terms of very specific stuff, it's like... Hit the mic. I, I, I don't have an answer, I'm just no. um, You stumped the battle! <laughs> well, it's everyone can go home. I mean, I guess you're basically asking, like, what kind of stories you would tell that. So, so it's basically, tell me, we start to tell you what our stories would be, right? In a way, so... Yeah. Well, I mean, Look at the that. experience of him, right? He knows how to get out of answering this question. <laughs> <laughs> like, you can tell like an Odyssey story of him on the wander with his love back home trying to get to work and distract him away. That'd be cool. Or uh, yeah, you could tell like a Beowulf story with him fighting the big monster and and, 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 and then get to fight the monster's mom. That'd be cool. the Nord anthology. Yeah. 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 yeah, I was an Ivy League school motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hi guys. Hey. First of all, shout out to Tim Sale, you're a legend. Yeah. Woo! Uh, just curious what you guys think about Robert Pattinson being cast as Batman. <laughs> You know, I'll, I'll answer. It's, it's, I think it's, it's silly to kind of premature, prematurely ahead of the curve and see what the guy does with the piece. Because, because, because I'll just tell you, because when, when Keaton was cast, I thought that'd be terrible. You know, uh, I didn't think he had the look, and by what he'd done previously, I didn't think it was the right fit. And it turned out to be a really great Batman. So, you know, I, I say give it a chance and see where it goes. You know, um, Heath Ledger was sort of the same. You didn't really kind of get that casting, but, right, it's kind of like an iconic vision that he portrayed. So I just go, give, give the guy a chance. I mean, there's, you know, you've got a 50-50 chance of being disappointed or pleasantly surprised or, you know, so I, I don't have an opinion until I watch the movie, you know? I want to see, you know, because anything can happen. Right. Also, also directors have a lot of influence of the, of the way the movie turns out. That's almost out of the hands of, of a particular actor. So we'll just see if the formula is right. That's a good. That's the right answer. Yeah. <laughs> of course, it's the right answer. It was my answer. Uh, yeah, great. Great. Next question. <laughs> oh, okay. Hello, so for me it's less of a question and just more of a thank you to everybody on this panel because Batman's such a prolific character and has gone through so many mythos changes. So everyone here has made like their own impact on it and that's why we're all here today. So just thank you to everyone on the panel. He's such an amazing character. We love you, thank you very much. I do have a question, but thank you as well. Um, just for all of you, what's your favorite Batman story? Yeah. 
Frank Frank Miller's Dark Knight uh, Returns to me is like it's just so perfect and great and and so as a matter of fact like any of my any anybody who I know who's never read a comic book and uh, is not into comics I let them borrow my copy my copy is very beat up <laughs> and the only rule is you have to return it uh, because I just think it's brilliant so. That's my very, very favorite, and I just, I love it so much. And by the way, Frank finally signed it for me, so it never gets loaned out anymore. <laughs> it's in a drawer, in plastic, and been trying. But uh, to me, I, I, that's my very ultimate favorite. Kind of the same thing for me. I'm obsessed with year one. I read it uh, three, four times a year. Yeah, also proud uh, entirely. It's, it's unbeatable. <laughs> You have to, I'm sorry, Mr. Man. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Man. Never happened before. Does that cartoon count? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cartoon. All of them. All, every single cartoon. That's a cartoon. That's a great answer. Phantasm. Yes, that's the phantasm. Okay, so no, the correct answer is the Frank Miller stuff. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, just, to give, just to give an alternate. Uh, Alex Kelly was a great artist, and he did a story of Death the Haunted Skies in the 70s, and it's just like an eight-page story, and I will love it. If I just oh. pick like one perfect short story. But if I was to play in my heart, it would be the Frank Miller story. Uh, yeah. uh, same answer in terms of the Frank Miller stuff is just far and beyond, but the, uh, for me, I would say the um, Englehart Rogers Strange Apparitions. Real quick, I know we're all got a lot of questions that we probably won't stand up for. 
anymore. I just want to thank all of you guys and gals for coming out here and uh, yeah. having thank this you. Thank you. for us. My question is basically, uh, I haven't gotten too far into the metal series, but I started reading it and I'm just kind of like enthralled with how did the genesis of this thought come around? For metal? Uh, me and my wife were at Scott's house visiting and uh, told me he had the perfect comeback story for me after I finished Reborn. And he goes, because you're kind of metal. And so the story, I'll call it metal. And he'll be like, back down battle axes and Joker dragon. And I went, I'm in. That's the genesis right there, man. Very cool. Thank you. Hi. I echo the thanks for all of you guys coming out here. This is amazing to have you all sitting under like. Especially Tom Kim. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but my question is, so, <laughs> so I'm sure you've heard the adage, you can't write for others, you have to write for yourself, or you can't create art for others, you have to do it for yourself, but how do you balance the artistic vision that you have for your characters with the entire canon of what's come before to stay true to who those characters have been, with you know, all the family, I'm sure you guys also hear, how do you balance all that? Honestly, it's a, it's a constant uh, it's a constant struggle. Or, or struggle is the wrong word, but it's something that I, like I, I'm constantly thinking about. Um, like I'm I'm deeply a fan of these characters and the stories that have come before, and uh, those stories very much inform the stories that I tell today. And I always go back to my touchstones to try to bring the spirit uh, that made me love the characters into the work I'm doing uh, now. Uh, but I also, like, I, I do have kind of a personal message that I am trying to, to bring, and a lot of times I sort of tie myself to the characters that uh, matter the most to me in key moments of my life with the sort of the, the thing I was going through in that moment in my life, uh, which is why, like, Tim Drake is a character that uh, I tap into a lot uh, when I am, I'm, I'm dealing with some of, the, uh, some of the stuff I went through when I was in high school, when I was roughly Tim's age, and, uh, not literally, I didn't face an army of drones. And oh, come on! <laughs> you know, like, that is uh, his issues with, uh, you know, facing his ideals with, uh, and the way uh, the real world gets in the way of your idealism and all of that, and uh, the struggle he faced in, in my detective room was something that I, you know, I faced myself. So that was sort of how I came in through the character I love the most with what I was going through when I love that character the most. See, this is why I said, you know, because I, I say that, like, all of us experience life uh, and, and it affects who we are and who we become. And so I usually talk about it in, in, in the context of art where, uh, you know, if, if, if we all, 10 artists are sitting in the room to ball, uh, draw uh, like a bowl of fruit, it, it'll look different from all those artists, even though they're all looking at the same thing because the way you've experienced life and the way you feel about things influences how you interpret those things. And so speaking to that point is like perfect, right? Because his own personal experiences have now gone to affect his creative writing. And, and, and it's just no different even from the art. It's not as deep as that. Like for my, my interpretation of Batman, it's just, I've looked at all the same things that you've all seen, right? I started probably with the 66 TV show and I had coloring books and there were cartoons and movies and everything like that. And so you absorb all that stuff and, and you feel a certain way about that and maybe it's tinted by your own personal experiences in life. And so it goes into this blender and just comes out. And, and that's the beauty of creating. Uh, because all these guys are great creators, guys and gals, not excluding lovely Marie. And, and so all this, that's what makes it so beautiful, the creation of music, art, and, and anything, because it's its all coming out of your filter of how you've experienced life, and, and that's the beauty of it. And Shane just framed it so perfectly, and that he's drawing on those personal experiences, and that's the magic of it all. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Thank you for all coming here. It's meant to a lot for our fans. So my question is, Batman is probably the DC character who has the most crossovers with other properties. I would like to ask, which character you like him to cross over? It could be anything, like you like, no matter. It doesn't have to be the, like a detective or a superhero, it could be anything. Batman, I want detective. 
Okay, now you don't mean that. Batman Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Volume 3 is in stores right now. <laughs> Serious, I would uh, I, I would put uh, Batman up against Freddy Krueger at some point. I would love to write uh, like a really messed up horror story with that. Nightmare on Elm Street. There we go. There we go. Oh, dude, that was awesome. DC Comics, get this man a job. Sell the most and pay me the most royalties. That's, 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 that's sort of the one I would go for. Yeah, yeah. 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 Now, I'm going to tell you a disappointing story, right? It's because uh, I was seeing you at the Comic Con many years ago when Todd made a big announcement. He and I were up there saying we're going to do the sequel to Spawn Batman, and it never happened. And now I go, it's almost a, a sin to not do it now that I've actually drawn Batman, too. So, you know, I hope that somehow, someday that does happen. That would be my pick, honestly. And that's not even about money. That was a joke. Well, not a joke. We all need that. We all need that. But, uh, yeah, I think that would be really out of a super cool factor because now I've done both professionally to do a Swamp Batman crossover. So that would be my pick. I remember I was watching The Purge on TV one night while I was working. And, like, it just pissed me off so much that these horrible people were doing all these horrible things with no consequences. I was like, you need to drop Batman into that shit. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Hey guys. Hi. Great to see you all here again. Uh, my name is Nico from Seattle. So Hi. great to see you. Uh, made the trip nice and safe. So, um, years ago, I'm going to not date myself, uh, when I read Batman and the Cult, when I got to the end, uh, you know, for me, I was a little rocked when I saw Batman broken mentally versus, you know, physically, where everybody kind of knows it. Um, has there ever been a, a book that just kind of rocked you a little bit, where you're just like, I did not see that coming, I did not see the, the character kind of get pushed that way, and maybe influenced you in either other stories or your writing style? Every Tom King book I've ever worked on. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Court of Owls because uh, uh, you know Scott like really unseated Batman in a way that um, you know Batman is really arrogant and conceited in that he thinks he knows Gotham inside and out and nobody knows him better. And for Scott to inject the, the owls that have been there for 400 years or whatever under his nose and he's been unaware. I mean, what better way to unseat a character? Yeah. To go, you don't know anything, kid. You know. I mean, so I just went. Wow, I mean, Scott, whenever we're on a panel and, and he's asked what his favorite uh, storyline is, he never mentions Quirk. But to me, that's it. I mean, to me, I think that's a crowning achievement to do that. Especially because Batman Mythos has been around for so long and so much has been done with it. And now to just take that element and go, ow, and, and inject that in there, uh, to me, that is, wow, yeah, great. Just great. That's awesome. Yeah. I think if you look at comics, like it's that you that rocks you when you're reading it, Spidey 121 and 122 as a kid. It was something that, when that happened, that kind of changed comics for me. Yeah. Forever. So that, was, that was a big moment. Uh, a lot of I've heard that like a preacher and a man, like a lot of stuff in there, it, like stuck with me forever. And then, let's spoil it. There's some stuff that happens with Starman, like Jerry Johnson and Starman. There's stuff all in there that I always remember. I remember reading it, you know, feeling it, like, oh man, I hate this. Like, ooh, this hurts. <laughs> Hello everyone, thanks for being here, I echo the same sentiments. Um, so in psychology there's something called the flow state where if you're too tense you start to make errors because you're anxious and you're too tidy. 
And then if you're too relaxed, you're not really in that zone. So like athletes call it being in the zone. So I'm curious for Clay or anyone else who might have jumped in. Um, how do you get in that zone? What is it like to be in the zone when you're writing? Or Rammstein. Yeah. Rammstein. <laughs> Here's a question to get in the zone. So right away, you know, I start to get immersed in, in that environment by reading the script. And so it doesn't take very long. I'm, I'm not a guy who does warm-ups before I start drawing. I just sort of start going. And so, it, you know, I just I get into that environment. I get into the heads of the characters. I get into the actual, uh, you know, surroundings. You know, if I'm in Gotham City streets, I'm really in Gotham City streets. And it's really annoying when people come into my room. My wife will come into my room, and I'll go, and I put down my pencil and go, yeah, and, you know, and I love her, but you know, now you yank me out of this this place because I'm, I'm actually in that place, and now I have to, when she leaves, go back into that place, which doesn't take very long. You turn the sprinklers back on. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, it just it just happens naturally, you know. Once I start drawing the stuff, I I'm there. I'm I'm in it. And, and so I can be pulled out of it from interruption, and but when I'm in it, I'm immersed in that environment. How do I make that happen? Uh, I don't know how it happens, it just does. You know, it just does. Uh, for me, uh, it's, I, I, I write my dialogue first. Uh, I get into the flow of the language, and I end up cutting it, like a lot of it out uh, towards, towards the end, but it really is sort of starting with the flow of ideas and the banter and the back and forth, and that's where once I start, once I kind of catch into the story, then that's when like the weird thing with uh, the writing flow happens, where time stops happening like at the regular rate, and then all of a sudden, you know, some amount of time later, there's a like uh, a relatively full script in front of you. Mm. All right. Well, thank you. Sure. sure. All right, thanks guys. Um, that's it for the questions. We're going to have them go to their tables next for signings. Um,